Climatic zoning for building energy policy is an important tool because it supports legislation regarding building components and requirements for the building industry. In the case of Brazil, that's the main object of this video, you have here two pictures, one taken in Manaus, which is in the middle of the Amazon forest, and the other one in the southern part of Brazil, close to Uruguay and Argentina. It's hard to distinguish the two. The construction industry in the country was organized in such a way that the same techniques and the same building shape and the same design is used all over the territory because there is no effective energy policy for buildings in Brazil. And having a robust climate zoning can support this sort of policy. So climatic zoning starts with gathering climatic data from several locations. And these are the almost 300 locations that were used in this proposal. And these are the 300 locations that are available now with recent data. In all these locations, you have a typical year of data, so 8,560 hours, hourly values. So every hour you have values of temperature, relative humidity, radiation, wind speed, and so on. So it's a massive amount of data. What usually is done, and that's a current state of the art in the field, is that you neglect most of these variables. And even those that you retain air temperature and relative humidity, you will work with daily averages or annual averages. So the complexity of the climate is highly ignored in this process. And many people will argue that you don't need the other data. You can rely only on air temperature and humidity, let's say, because the other ones are closely related to those. And by taking only these into account, you have a simpler analysis, as effective as it would be if all data is taken into account. Let's see if that's actually true. We have in this case here four locations, two in the coast and two in the heart of Brazil and South America. Looking at temperature data on annual means, all these four locations, they have very similar values. The same happens for relative humidity and for the degree days for cooling, which are another way to take into account average temperatures. So in principle, these four climates, they should be comparable, almost the same. When we look into this other graph, we see that the cities on the coast, they have very small daily amplitudes. So the difference between day and night is small, which means that the building cannot cool down during the night, but the building doesn't get that hot during the day. While in the cities in the middle of the country, you have a much higher daily amplitude, which means much warmer peak temperatures during the day. And much colder temperatures during the night that allow the building to cool down. So these two locations are substantially different in terms of climate. The same happens in terms of wind. The ones close to the coast are exposed to much higher wind speeds because there is a pattern of airflow between continent and the Atlantic Ocean. And you cannot see that in the middle of the country. Some would argue that these differences are not relevant, so the building is not sensitive to these parameters. Let's see how they affect building performance. In this graph, what you see are two indicators for the cities. The dark green is energy demand for cooling for a particular house, a sample house, let's put it this way. And you see that locations close to the coast are around 200, while locations in the middle of the country are close to 240. This happens because in these locations, the wind removes the solar radiation that reaches the surface more quickly. So as soon as the sun reaches the surface of a building, wind will remove this heat and prevent the heat from penetrating into the building, in the case of building with air conditioning. In the case of building with no air conditioning, and you can measure the performance of the building by the number of hours that the building is just too hot, you see a variation between 80% in locations on the coast and close to 100% in locations in the middle of the country. So a variation of around 20% both for buildings with air conditioning and without air conditioning. And this 20% is important, saving 20% of energy or improving the quality of life of people with 20% of the time is not a trivial task. If we put these two locations in the same climatic zone, we will prescribe building materials, performance for air conditioning, types of glazing and so on in the same way for the two locations when in fact they are substantially different. So that's why climatic zone is so important. And the averages don't tell the whole story about how climate behaves and how it affects building. 
Ideally, what we would like to have is have one variable that can capture how the building is affected by all these variables over each hour of the year, which is a challenging task. How can you see the combined effect of all these variables in one or more buildings in all these locations over a whole year? That's the point where modeling the building stock and simulating the performance of the building stock comes handy. If we have samples of buildings that are typical in the country with and without HVAC, with different levels of insulation, thermal mass, glazing, and so on, we list these parameters, we define their geometry, we can, yes, use this data to simulate the performance of this building over each point in the territory using building performance simulation. So the idea is the following. Giving one or more houses, you will set indicators such as energy demand for heating or cooling, number of hours in discomfort for cold or heat, mold growth risk, that's a handy indicator because it shows how humidity plays a role in building performance, and we will calculate the performance for each building in each one of these locations as you see in this map here. So these are results of almost 300 simulations for this particular geometry for a set of building properties and we can see that the cooling requirements in the south are close to 50 here, 100 here and up to 250 in the northern part of the country. So now we have one single value which is cooling that encapsulates all the climatic variables and weights these climatic variables depending on how the building stock in this particular country is defined. We can now use this data to define the zone. So we cluster the data based not on the climatic variables, but based on the impact of the climatic variables into the built environment using this variable. In reality, we will use several variables, so heating, cooling, discomfort by heat, by cold, mold growth, and we will use several of these maps for different buildings with different properties. But the data that's used in the zoning process, in the clustering process, is the performance data rather than the climatic data. And the goal here is the following, if you look at this, as the cooling demand in all those points in the previous map. If we look at the cooling requirement, we would like to define zones that have a typical performance for that particular building. In this way, we will minimize the overlap between the zones. So here you see zone three and all the points in zone three. And some of the points that are in zone three, they actually have a performance that's typical of the range of zone four. And that's what we will try to minimize in the zone process try to make sure that each zone has a typical performance range and then you can prescribe measures to save energy and improve performance for this performance range, making sure that this is target for that particular location and building stock. Here you see the results of five performance indicators for all zones in Brazil, all the 10 climatic zones that are proposed in this video. And details about this proposal, interactive maps and documents are provided in the description of this video below. Here you see 10 zones, cooling, heating, overheating for cases where I don't have HVC, cold discomfort in case you don't have HVC again, heating, and mold growth for these two buildings here. And what we see is that, for example, zone 1 has a very clear low cooling requirement because it's the coldest one and has a very high heating requirement compared to the other zones. It's small compared to cooling, around 10 kilowatt hours per square meter, compared to 50 kilowatt hours per square meter for cooling. But still, this is perceived as a cold zone. The same applies for zones two and three. They have similar performance here, but when we look at heating load, we can understand that they are actually different. Zones five and six, which again, look similar when we look to this indicator or this indicator here. But when you look at mold growth, one is very dry and the other one is very cold. So this is the performance range that's typical for the zone. The same applies for zone seven and eight. Very similar performance in terms of cooling load or overheating, but one humid and the other one dry. And for the zones nine and 10, with a bit of overlap here, but but not that much overlap in the cooling load, one substantially warmer than the other one. 
So that's the idea that you use the performance data to define typical ranges of performance for each one of these points in the territory and group these points by performance rather than by climatic data. And this is the result that you would see using this approach. So this almost 300 points clustered based on the performance of these five indicators for around 50 different variants of the building, depending on material properties and the presence or not of an HVC system. This performance range that's typical, we saw in the box plot, one by one separate. If we plot them together, we can even have a better understanding about this unique performance space. Here you see zones one, two, and three. The points plotted for the zones in terms of heating load and cooling load for a given building. And it's clear that each zone has a specific performance range that is covered and is exactly the same building in all these locations. So any variation that you see here is the impact of all the climatic variables into this performance. So this is for zones one, two, and three. For the warmer zones, where the key element is humidity against cooling or against overheating, we see the same, see here, mold growth risk, humid zones, five, seven, and nine, and dry zones, six, eight, and 10. There are a couple of points that are classified in zone seven, let's suppose, but they're in the middle of the performance of zone five. This is because this is just one sample for one building. In reality, you would see graphs like this for all the almost 50 variants of the building, 50 variants of the archetype that were used in the process. And in some cases, the point will fall in the wrong space of performance. But if you analyze all of them together, most of the time, the point will fall in this range. So this process tries to accommodate the fact that different buildings react differently to climatic variables. And so it's natural that in some specific buildings, this classification will show this sort of small anomalies. But in general, for the vast majority of the country and for the vast majority of the archetypes, the classification is robust or is the most robust possible. Another thing that's interesting about this process is that it captures all the trade-offs between many climatic variables and geographic features in the territory. This is the map of zone three in this area of the country. And what we can see is that parts in the southern area of zone three, they're close to the sea level, six meters. As you go north, close to the equator, this, la this altitude increases 700, 800, 1300. And the energy consumption remains the same, around 80 for all these points, for the same building. So what you see is that as you move close to the equator, in principle, you would have higher temperatures, more solar radiation, but the fact that you are way above sea level will reduce this impact, reducing temperature and keeping the building performance in the same level, which means that when you design the building for any of these points, you should expect to see the same performance. And when you apply an energy conservation measure, you also should see a similar impact of this energy conservation measure. So performance-based climatic zoning can capture all the features of climate geography and encapsulate them in a single or in a few variables, which are the performances of the, or the performance indicators for that building and can also collate or coordinate the multiple archetypes that are available in the building stock in such a way to provide the zoning that's the most robust that will work for most locations for most buildings possible. There's an additional challenge because up to this point we have been talking about how you classify points. So you see here points in this tiny area of the country in zones 9, 10 and 8 and how you interpolate this. There are techniques to interpolate data and they have a high uncertainty, let's put it like this. Another approach, which seems to be adequate according to our interviews with local experts, dozens of them, is to design this boundary using knowledge about altitude, knowledge about other climatic variables, discuss it with locals, 
in such a way that you say for a location here where we don't have data, is it more likely to be close to this, close to that, or close to this one? And in this particular example, we see that there is an area of high altitude that comes from the inner part of the country towards the coast. And according to analysis of climatic data available for these areas in a lower quality, so it cannot be used for simulation, and discussions with local experts, the best design is to have the zone 8 propagating and following the trends of topography in separating zone 9 into parts, separating zone 10 into parts, and keeping the zonal coast. And zone 9 also helping here because of the difference in elevation to draw the bound to draw the boundary between zones 9 and 10. So this is an approach that uses local experts, topography data and additional data source for climate to draw the boundaries of the zone without using interpolation. A more robust and handcrafted design of the zones. And this is the final proposal for the Brazilian zone with 10 climatic zones, clearly separating three zones that are hot and humid, two on the coast and one in the inner part of the country, with some coastal areas as well, close to the equator. Two cold zones in the south, high elevation areas here, two transition zones, three and four, and three dry zones, six, eight, and 10. This one, the extremely hot. The product of performance of buildings and how this performance is affected by climate, rather than hand picking just a few climatic variables, averaging them and losing the adequate resolution to understand how this could be used in energy policy. This technique can be applied in other countries as well, and the tools are available as open source software. See the link on the description of the video.